Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be sitting here with Dr. Peter Atia, who has a medical degree from Stanford University, and he has done a residency in surgery, I believe, and also some some uh, research in surg surgical oncology with uh, Dr. Steven Rosenberg, mm -hmm. I believe. Very interesting uh, background, broad interest. Uh, I know of him from being on uh, Tim Ferriss' podcast, where he talked a lot about some of his self-experimentation using a variety of different uh, dietary techniques. But um, I'm really excited to uh, talk with Peter today because we have a lot of overlap in our interest in longevity, particularly the role of diet, um, nutrition, and other lifestyle factors like sleep, exercise, stress, and longevity. So thanks for being here, Peter. Sure. So um, maybe we could start a little bit with what are you, what are you eating then to to try to delay the aging process? Like what is, so diet obviously plays a very important role in aging and I'm trying to figure out exactly the best diet to eat and I can talk a little bit about what I've, what mm -hmm. I think, but I'd love to get some of your thoughts. So, I mean, I think the short answer is we don't know definitively and I don't think we're going to know definitively if you define definitively as a randomized clinical trial of longevity in humans. Of course. Know, we have to posit that we're never gonna figure that out. So instead we have to rely on proxies. So we, uh, we look at proxies in animals where you can do virtually anything you want in a totally controlled setting, but then you run the risk of two things. One, are you identifying diets that are clinically and biologically meaningful to your host? For example, if you put you know, a humanized diet into a mouse, what you learn may or may not extrapolate to the mouse, uh, extrapolate to the human. Um, and then secondly, you're really hindered by the idea that you're studying that animal in an artificial environment. And when you reduce the risk of a subset of metabolic, or a subset of death, a subset of you know, causes of death, which is effectively metabolic disease, you're often unable to measure what in my opinion is an underappreciated um, risk that comes on, which is sort of the more sudden and traumatic causes of death that we take for granted, especially in the case of caloric restriction. So that's the problem with animals. Then what we do in humans is we can rely on our best proxy biomarkers that we think reflect the systems that drive aging. And we can measure those things over time and sort of you know, estimate what we think is the effect of you know, this dietary change or that dietary change or this lifestyle change or that drug change on those things. And so um, I basically try to focus my efforts on those, on, on, on sort of converging those two worlds, um, but acknowledging that we're never going to know the answer for certain and we're going to have to use our best judgment around those things and, and hope that in time certain other things do become available. Um, for example, it would be really great if there was a way in the blood to measure the activity of mTOR. We don't have that. Um, it would also be great if we could you know, measure other growth pathways like the RAS pathway uh, without having to rely on you know, tissue biopsies and things like that. So um, just for people that don't know what mTOR is, can you explain why that's really important? Yeah, so there are, there are probably, um, depending on who you talk with, or we, I would say there are two or three major growth pathways in the body that are kind of responsible for growth, both in the positive sense and in the pathologic sense. The two that I focus on the most are the IGF pathway and the mTOR pathway. Now, mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. Um, I think for the sake of time, I will not tell my favorite story, which was is a, is a story that is both the discovery of rapamycin and uh, perhaps more interestingly, the elucidation of how it worked. But suffice it to say, the compound rapamycin was identified first, um, long before a really amazing guy named David Sabatini as a PhD student at Hopkins in 1993, 94, um, as a side project in a lab made the discovery that this thing, rapamycin, was actually working by inhibiting a protein complex of which TOR, target of rapamycin as it became named, was the central piece. We now know today that it can form into two complexes. One is called mTOR complex one or mTORC1 and the other is mTOR complex two, TORC2. Um, and we also know that it exists in different tissues and it has different activities in different tissues. And so like most things in the body, too much or too little is a bad thing. So if you have no mTORC1, for example, in your muscles, uh, 
you'd wither away and that would be a debilitating condition. And in fact, for people with muscular dystrophy, one of the things you want to do is figure out how to alter that pathway. But similarly, we know that over overactivity uh, is, is predisposing us to aging and of course certain diseases of aging like cancer. So for uh, people that, you know, when, when Peter mentioned that you might, if you don't have any mTORC1 activity, you might, you know, ca cause muscle wasting. Well, that's because mTOR does play a very important role in protein synthesis. And uh, what's very interesting is that both the two pathways that you mentioned in being involved in aging, mTOR and IGF-1, uh, IGF-1 actually increases mTOR activity. So, you know, they're, they're yeah, in these a, aren't these aren't independent pathways. Right. Yeah. And what's also very interesting is that they're both uh, regulated by amino acid intake. Right. Yes. So IGF-1, one of the major. So IGF-1 is also a growth factor that um, you do need as well. So it's one of those things where you don't have any IGF-1. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're going to not you're going to be in trouble. I mean, there's a lot of positive things about IGF-1, muscle growth, muscle repair, right. neuronal growth. But too much IGF-1 also can allow damaged cells to right. continue growing. Um, but are you familiar with like any of the uh, dietary nutritional research on IGF-1 and mTOR and specifically with amino acids and how? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of my biggest obsession, I think, is probably around those topics. So um, it's complicated. I think we have probably a better understanding of mTOR. I mean, I think it's very clear that mTOR is amino acid driven. Um, in fact, what's today? Last Thursday, eight days ago, David Sabatini and his group at MIT published a paper in Science um, that identified um, the amino acid sensor for mTORC1. Now, it's always been suspected what it was, which was leucine, was the highest uh, affinity. Um, but in fact, it was, he's now crystallized that structure. So um, if you even think about it through the lens of like, why do bodybuilders or people who you know, love lifting weights want to take branch chain amino acids while they're exercising? Uh, the reason is largely through this empirical observation that it enhances muscle growth uh, and or prevents muscle degradation during exercise. What I think is really interesting is that, you know, we now know exactly what's going on. So the branch chain amino acids, there are three, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Uh, it turns out that isoleucine and valine are virtually irrelevant. It's pretty much all leucine. Um, and what's really clever, just from an evolutionary perspective, is that mTORC in muscle has a much higher affinity for leucine than mTORC1 in fat or in hepatocytes. Now that's a good thing because you'd like to believe that in times of nutrient deprivation, even a trace amount of leucine should preferentially provide the muscle with its growth signal before providing the adipocyte or hepatocyte. So, so from a nutrient sensing pathway, what you could infer from that is too little leucine, probably a bad thing. Um, too much leucine, probably a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what too much and too little are, I think, remains to be seen. Right. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, and one of the questions a friend of mine asked me recently, actually a mutual friend, Tim Ferriss, um, is, you know, can we, can we take too much leucine during a workout? Um, and again, I don't think we know the answer, but, you know, extrapolating from the animal data, I think five grams of leucine during a workout, probably not harmful. And it also doesn't stick around very long because when we take amino acids in a workout, if you sort of sip them throughout the workout, you're taking a free amino acid. So it's got a relatively short uh, stay in the body. In fact, one of the pharmaco interests on this front, which is to treat diseases of muscular wasting, is to actually come up with molecules that are not necessarily more potent agonists of the leucine receptor, but would stick around a lot longer. Because that's actually the problem with the nutrition side. Is we can't keep leucine around long enough to stimulate muscle growth. Okay, so that's the, that's the easy story. Right. Now the hard one. IGF. Yes. Okay, so two schools of thought on this. I am in one camp. Um, but I will acknowledge the other camp. One camp says IGF-1 is driven exclusively by amino acids. Mm -hmm. um, the other camp says, no, it's actually driven by uh, amino acids and carbohydrates. Yes. And carbohydrates indirectly via insulin. Yes. So... Why are those mutually exclusive? I mean, oh, uh, the way I define it, when I'm, there are certain people who I will not name that are prominent in the field uh, who, who I will argue with that will argue that the carbohydrates play no role. It's virtually all protein. But there is a role that they do play. That's been shown. Depending, I believe it has been shown. It but been I, shown. I, I mean, there are, there are 
wonderfully erudite people in this field who believe it is entirely an amino acid issue. Okay. Um, and it is true, methionine has probably been shown to be the most active amino acid in driving IGF mm -hmm. uh, pathway. However, as it sounds like you agree, um, it's pretty clear that as insulin levels go down, yes. IGF-BP3 goes up as IGF-BP3, uh, sorry, IGF-binding protein 3 goes up. Uh, maybe it's worth me taking yeah, a moment to explain why that down. matters. So most of these things, as maybe the listeners know, you know, when we have hormones floating around the body, whether it be testosterone, whether it be cortisol, whether it be, uh, you know, thyroxine, these things, they don't, because they're typically hydrophobic, they can't just travel through the bloodstream freely, they have to be bound and carried, just as cholesterol does. And so it's these binding proteins that we often don't think about that play a, an important role in determining how much active or bioavailable hormone is free. So in the case of IGF-1, it gets trafficked by this IGF binding protein. And most of these binding proteins actually bear an unbelievable relationship to insulin. So sex hormone binding globulin goes up when insulin goes down. It's very interesting. There's always this complaint that um, free testosterone levels will drop all things equal in someone who restricts carbohydrates. And um, I remember sort of hearing that empirically and not really thinking much about it until I started to, one, observe it, and two, understand why. And it's quite obvious. Because again, all things equal, when insulin goes down, which is usually what happens when you restrict carbohydrates, sex hormone binding globulin goes up. That means if you have no change in testosterone level or even estradiol level, free testosterone will go down less testosterone is around to be unbound to the sex hormone binding globulin. So, um, so, so it's for that reason that I think that insulin and carbohydrate do play an important role in the IGF pathway. And I also think empirically, um, not that I like to refer to ecology or epidemiology, but when you look at the ecology and epidemiology of cancer, um, to my knowledge, the content of highly refined carbohydrate and sugar uh, is more predictive of cancer in a society than the, uh, the variety in protein content. In other words, there are cultures that have consumed larger and lesser amounts of protein that have been without mass uh, yeah. amounts of cancer, but the same cannot be said with large amounts of these things. Now, the problem by these things, I mean uh, sugars and high glycemic index are high. The problem with that is, of course, you can't infer cause from that. But the negative to me is suggestive that at the very least, carbohydrate content matters when it comes to IGF-1 signaling. Absolutely. And the way I like to think about it, actually, when <clears throat> you're discussing these two things is, you know, IGF-1 is not a cancer initiator. Like, it's not going to cause the initial damage that can make a normal cell aberrant, a normal cell that acquires whatever problems it acquired to make it you know, turn into a right. cell that's not cancer. What IGF-1 is really good at doing is taking that cell that's it's already acquired the damage. Yeah. Right, and saying, here, keep growing. Like, no, don't die. I know there's signals in your body that are trying to kill right, you, right. but don't die. You know, whereas the, the refined carbohydrates, the way I always think about it is, you know, that leads to a variety, a plethora of physiological processes in your body, inflammatory processes, you know, a lot of different... Um, pathways that are causing damage, that are initiating the type of damage. So it's like, well, if you have someone that's eating a terrible diet, they're eating refined carbohydrates, they're, you know, they're releasing endotoxin in their gut, they've got this constant inflammatory process going on, they're releasing hypochlorite damage, you know, they're damaging mitochondria, damaging DNA, blah, blah, blah. Well, and then, you know, they've, so they've acquired all these damaged cells, and then they're eating, you know, a bunch of protein and activating the IGF-1 pathway. It's like dynamite. It's like, here, here's the damaged cell, and here's the, the signals to, to like, keep, keep living and keep growing. So I kind of... Yeah, I mean, I, I think, so you obviously alluded to this, and I think many patients, when I talk to them, um, are sort of surprised to learn that every one of us has cancer. I mean, at this moment, I have millions of cancer cells in my body, as do you. The, the, the good thing is virtually all of the time the problem gets eradicated, right? So either we talk about the apoptotic pathways that you described, but even when those pathways fail, our immune system is remarkable. Um, I did my postdoc in immunotherapy, so I yeah. spent about two and a half years working uh, with T cells, um, specifically regulatory T cells and looking at this problem. And, you know, we just take for granted how good the humoral 
uh, the, the cellular immune system is, rather. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for those, again, maybe not familiar with immunology, you know, you have your B cell system, your T cell system. These T cells, which are the ones that fight viruses, are unbelievable. Um, when you think about how many antibiotics we have in our arsenal to fight bacterial infections, it's remarkable. Think about how many antiviral drugs we have relative to antibiotics. We have very few. And we certainly don't have them for the most common viruses we acquire. And yet, virtually all of us recover, in the end, unharmed, from the typical viral infection we get two to three times a year. That's a testament to how amazing our immune system is. And when you unleash it against cancer, it's effective 99.9% .9 of the time. So yeah, the name of the game is avoid the amplifiers. Now, the other reason why I think this is an important thing, an important concept that goes beyond cancer, but now gets to the broader aspect of aging is, um, when you look at the people who live the longest, when you look at these people who live to 100 and beyond, for the most part, they die of the exact same diseases as the rest of us schleps. They just get them later. That's really important because I think it offers an insight into longevity that is um, often overlooked. So if the people who live to 100, 105 were all dying in car accidents and plane crashes, you might make the argument that there's two classes of citizens, right? There's the people who get chronic disease, and then there's people who will never, ever, ever get it, and eventually they just die of something else. Because remember, the fourth leading cause of death or the fifth leading cause of death starts to become accidental stuff once you get outside of the chronic stuff. But that's not the case. The point is we're all sort of pre-programmed to go through this process. But if you want to live longer, the name of the game is delaying the onset of the big three. Mm -hmm. The big three being the diseases that will kill 75% of us. So cerebrovascular and cardiovascular, cancer and neurodegenerative. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so that brings us back to why we don't, well, why we've got to have IGF and mTOR in check, because right. we've got to prevent them from being able to sort of amplify that. Right. And um, so I still haven't answered your question, which is how do you do this with diet? But 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 <laughs> well, <laughs> but so I think I, I will explain conceptually how you do it. How you do it at the individual level um, is, is is empirical and I think prescriptive, meaning you have to be able to. Try something, iterate on it, and make a measurement. But here's the conceptual way to do it. The conceptual way to do it, at least the way I do it, is you consume more or less the least amount of protein you can consume to maintain and grow muscle mass. But you don't need any more than that. So it depends on the individual. It depends on the timing of that protein ingestion, the quality of that protein, and the type of metabolic and uh, conditioning stimulus you put into it. But there's an amount. But for most of us, I think we're probably over-consuming protein relative to that actual need. So we, we, we raise protein level till we hit that amount. Carbohydrate, we do the opposite. Carbohydrate, we are basically lowering it until we reach the highest point, or pardon me, the lowest point that we can tolerate um, where we can maintain, and again, this is quick and dirty, but it's the lowest possible fasting insulin. And in my mind, I typically like to see that at below three or four as IU uh, of insulin. And you want to limit um, sort of post-meal glycemia. And I actually use a standardized test, which is an OGTT, which has its limits because it's liquid. You're drinking liquid glucose. I like to limit that postprandial um, hyperinsulinemia to a number. And I use a reference. I, I use a checkpoint of 30 that I want to be able to see within one hour of 75 gram glucose challenge if you can keep insulin below 30. So in my mind, because I can't do in what's called an AUC, an area under the curve. Mm -hmm. So the really rigorous way to do this would be I'd put a catheter in your arm and I would sample your blood every 30 or 60 minutes over the course of a day while you ate. And I would say, what's the, I'd integrate that function and there would be an area under the curve of insulin. And that's actually the number I care about. But since I can't do that outside of a research setting, I, I rely on these other proxies. So the bottom line is your carbohydrate content is highly variable by the individual, by their insulin sensitivity, by their muscle mass and their capacity to dispose of glucose and a host of other factors. But the bottom line is you don't want to consume any more carbohydrate than you can without blowing through those parameters. And you don't want to consume any more protein than you need to to preserve that. And then basically fat becomes the fill. And so the point here is that that becomes a highly different diet for different people. Yeah. For some people, that's you know, 40% carbohydrate and 20% protein and the remainder fat. For others, that's 20% carbohydrate and 15% protein and the remainder of fat. So what about, uh, so your, your approach seems to really look at, uh, you know, insulin 
response. It's looking at, you know, obviously the IGF-1, mTOR, things that are dietary nutritional factors that are, you know, influencing those pathways. And then, of course, the rest being fat. Um, for me, I like to think about food as a what you're putting in your body, not only to activate these pathways or try to keep the pathways from being, you know, being too active, but also I like to think about it at the level of the gut because the gut, one, regulates the immune system big time. I mean, that's, you know, you've got more immune cells in your, in your gut than you do in any right. other organ in your body. And your, your gut bacteria, the interaction between your gut bacteria and your gut are also, in, you know, regulating the types of immune cells that you're making, regulatory T cells being, you know, right. put in that. Um, and also because it's the major source of inflammation, and inflammation even very recently has been identified to be a driver of the aging process. So, um, you know, eating things that are, are good for your gut, like fiber, um, and avoiding things that are going to cause a lot of gut damage. So I think about those things as well. Um, do you, do you, or, and then micronutrients, which is also very important. Micronutrients are cofactors for a variety of enzymes and proteins in the body to make sure they're, you know, functioning right. proteins that are involved in, you know, these processes we're talking about keeping cancer cells in check, you know, like, you know, P53, zinc-dependent proteins, uh, magnesium, which is important for repairing damage, things like that. Are those um, things that you consider at all when you're thinking about the influence of diet on the aging process? I don't think about it as much as a lot of people do. And I would hate to use the term I'm a gut skeptic because I don't, <laughs> I think that conjures up a whole bunch of negative images. But... Um, so, so, so I'm going to be a late adopter on this one, right? So uh, there are a whole bunch of facts that everybody can rattle off about the gut. A lot of them, by the way, are kind of BS. So the, the cells in the gut outnumber the cells in our body 10 to 1. That actually turns out to be false. Cells, uh, you mean bacterial cells? Yeah, sorry, the bacterial okay. cells versus, yeah, sorry, the, the bacterial cells within our gut. Um, so, so, so putting all that stuff aside, there are a whole bunch of really interesting facts. Yes. But it reminds me of, you know, what a good friend of mine once told me when I was trying to rationalize something I needed to do or so, thought I needed to do to him. I, he said, why are you doing this? And I said, blah, 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 blah. And he said, that's a fact, but is it a reason? And so that's kind of how I feel a little bit about the gut. Like there's a whole bunch of really interesting stuff, but I don't know that it actually matters that much, right? It's like, I'll, I'll give you a sort of a really idiotic example. The number of ants on this earth outnumber us 10 to 1. I'm making that up. Ergo, we should be doing more to protect the ants by avoiding climate change. Yeah, and I'm that's saying <laughs> no. That's that might be true. There might be more ants than us. And, yes, but but we're the species of interest. So so the point is. So that's my first sort of kind of lack of interest. The second is I don't really know what to do with it. Right. So yeah. I've been through it all. I've gone through all the sequencing. I've done it with patients, and. I have found that it's like there's a very crude set of tools that I can use in really obvious cases. So I had a patient that came to me two years ago who, um, you know, had a history of sinusitis, horrible history of sinusitis. So this is, she was, you know, she probably had to do an augmentin course six times a year because of recurrent sinusitis. She had three surgical procedures, just couldn't get better. So started working with her became pretty clear to me that there was something in her diet that was creating an inflammatory environment that wasn't a structural mm -hmm. problem. Um, so we made a lot of dietary changes, things got better, but in parallel to that, I sort of suspected that 10 years of six cycles of Augmentin probably altered her gut. And so yeah, she's an example of someone where I would do you know a sequence and look and be like, lo and behold, you're all yeast, right? Not yeah. surprisingly, and, and disproportional bacterial overgrowth. Okay, so she's an example of someone in whom the signal was so big that I, I felt like there was an intervention I could make, mm -hmm. which was both fixing her diet, but also utilizing agents that could alter that. But for the most part, I don't have a clue what to do. And all the people I see who claim to know what they do, like they can't convince me that they're knowing what they're doing. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't, I mean, I'm talking outside of a couple of really amazing examples. So we're familiar with how C. diff colitis works and the reversal of C. diff with stool transplant. So th those are remarkable examples. But, um, but some of the other stuff I'm still not clear of. So, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm happy to be convinced, but I'm not convinced yet that this is like the, that this is a reason and not just a fact. So um, I think that focusing on the gut microbiome and the number of, you know, bacterial cells that supposedly outnumber our human cells and all that. I don't think that's the important point. My 
you know, so I've become very interested in the gut, mostly because of a colleague of mine, Mark Shiganaga, who's been working, doing gut research uh, at Children's Hospital in Oakland, uh, and is brilliant. He's been, you know, showing me data, and I've just been convinced more and more that gut health, um, making sure that you're keeping the mucin, which your gut goblet cells are producing, you know, that disgustingly slimy mucus-like material that's keeping and separating the immune cells in your gut from all the microorganisms in your gut. And that's very important because when that starts to break down, the immune cells recognize bacteria and they start... And and I'm not asking this rhetorically, I just don't know. Is there an effective way to to diagnose that in patients? So the problem is, is that endotoxin release into the blood system would be the way to measure it and to diagnose it. So you could measure it through the lack lack of barrier, basically. You can measure the endotoxin levels in someone's blood, which is a marker, a proxy of of the throughput. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the problem is, is that getting that, there's also a lot of false uh, positives. That's right. So that's the only concern. Until that test, that diagnostic test can be um, Because it seems to me a stool test would be a more effective way to measure that. Endotox or oh, mucin? Mucin. Yeah, there might be there might yeah. be a way to do that to to measure it in a in a stool. Yeah. That would be that would be a, an interesting thing to yeah. explore because uh, the the so you know what I'm getting at here is I'm also a very I'm a scientist. You obviously are are a scientist and, and like to uh, be you know understand mechanism and see solid data before you you know think right. something is true. Um, and I have become more convinced that literally, like the endotoxin released from the gut, which is a constant, I mean, really the major source of inflammation in the body is. is and and to be clear, Rhonda, I'm not disputing that. So to, yes. to be clear, I, I, I bought that thesis back actually when I was a surgical resident because we would see endotoxemia, yeah. right? Surgical procedure gone bad, endotoxemia, right. ICU, right. death. We, I know what that looks like in its yes. most extreme state. What I think I'm more of a skeptic of, and again, a skeptic waiting to be convinced, is that I can intervene through, that I can make that diagnosis in a non-catastrophic case, which is basically the chronic case, yeah. and make an intervention, either through you know some alteration in the, in the microbiome itself, or uh, meaning directly, or indirectly through diet or other variables. So, and, and I think that would be a very interesting um, sort of sort of path to go down, uh, but but again, I, I I just I'm trying. There's so many things I don't know at the moment. I'm just trying to focus on the ones I do know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is there is some interesting work coming out of um, like Justin and Erica Sonnenberg Lab over at Stanford. I, I recently had a discussion with them on looking at the role of uh, fiber and certain types of fiber in fueling different species of bacteria in the gut and how those are generating short chain fatty acids and other yep. uh, signaling molecules which are regulating hematopoiesis, they're regulating you know, the number of Tregs that we're making. So it is very interesting that yeah. feeding our gut certain types of fiber, which are present in vegetables and a variety of you know, fruits even, um, do have a positive effect on the immune system via yeah. these, these signaling molecules that are being made in the gut. Um, that's, that's very interesting. It is one thing that I consider when I'm thinking about the effects of uh, diet on longevity. Because I think that these, while, you know, I foc- I've focused on insulin for a long time. I've been very interested in insulin. When I first um, I start, I was doing research at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, before I went to graduate school, I was working on aging and specifically um, doing different you know, genetic manipulations um, in C. elegans to look at the effects on aging. So insulin signaling was like right, right. obvious. Decrease insulin signaling, you're going to you know, increase yeah, this yeah. worm's lifespan by like up to 100%, which is like very profound. So I've been very focused on insulin for, for a long time and reducing, reducing the insulin signaling pathway, reducing the insulin response, you know, all that. However, I think that as I continue to look in humans and, the, you know, we're very, you know, complex organisms and there's lots of interactions between things going on between you know different things that are happening in our in our diet in our lifestyle that are affecting the way we age uh, and one of those I do think is gut health uh, I sort of began to become interested in what sort of diet is good for my gut and what is not good for my gut um, and I think we were talking a little bit about this before uh, before we started filming this, and that is uh, one thing I'm very also very interested in is the effects of fat on the gut. 
because fat can be very hard on the gut. Um, but I think that it also depends on a variety of factors. If you're eating it with protein, if you're, you know, if you already have, uh, you know, an unhealthy gut, um, if you're not exercising or you are exercising, things like that. Also, genetic factors play a very important role. Um, you know, certain certain polymorphisms in. Um, Don't ask me about APOE. P PPAR gamma. Yeah. Are, are influence uh, saturated fat versus polyunsaturated. Yeah, APOE. Yeah, I've actually got one APOE for a little, so I'm very interested in APOE. I'm actually writing a paper on APOE four and uh, its role in Alzheimer's right now. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you my take on that, which I'm sure you've seen the literature on it. But I, I actually think it's the phenotype that matters more than the genotype. Uh -huh. So in other words, I think it's the it's the amount of APOE that's expressed that matters, not the APOE that not the genotype. Um, in other words, just as we measure ApoB mm -hmm. as a surrogate for LDL particle number and VLDL and remnant VLDL particle, we can measure ApoE. Now, there's no clinically used or CLIA-approved assay for that yet, but there are labs that are doing it for experimental purposes. And there's a paper that I saw maybe six, nine months ago that actually showed that the if you take the ApoE 3-4s and 4-4s, so as you know, I'm sure better than I do, a 3-4 genotype just on a hazard ratio is about a 2x increase over the 3-3 three, three in terms of Alzheimer's disease. A 4-4, four, four, of course, is anywhere from 10 to 20x depending on the series. Okay, so if you're out there and you've got an APOE 3-4, or especially if you've got a 4-4, four, four, you're worried, right? And I'm, I'm worried for my patients who are 4-4s. Four, I have four patients who are 4-4s. Four, um, but when I saw this paper, what it showed was actually, and, and just so the listener would know, the majority of people with Alzheimer's do not are not 3-4 or 4-4. They're still 3-3. Three, three. The, the difference is this. Because remember, the 3-3 three, three is the majority of the population. I mean, the 3-4 three, four, three, four is actually pretty big. It's about 20%. But the 3-3 three, three is the largest one. So having a 3-3 three, three doesn't protect you from Alzheimer's. And having a 3-4 doesn't guarantee you're going to get it. The, um, and by the way, even a 4-4 four, four doesn't guarantee you're going to get it. So the key is, is there something else that's more predictive? And I think it's the phenotype. So when, they're, when they measure the serum level of APOE, it turned out to be more predictive of Alzheimer's disease than the genotype. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that we can get a clinically approved assay in a relatively short period of time that will allow us to actually do that, especially for the patients who are 3-4 and 4-4 which says, are you able to reduce your risk? So let's say I could measure you today yeah. and your APOE level was here. And then we could say, well, look, there's some intervention. We believe that reducing, you know, or increasing insulin sensitivity of your brain, you know, reducing the probability that pyruvate dehydrogenase is going to cause an energy shortage in your neuron um, is going to improve your odds for delaying or eliminating AD from the list. And then we could measure your APOE at a point in time and it were lower. That would give me some confidence that we were moving in the right direction. Because lower? So you're saying that the higher the, higher the, the APOE... expression, the higher the risk. That's higher what this the expression paper, in the plasma. In the plasma, the higher the risk. Hmm. Okay, so a couple things. One is... Um, I'm happy to show you the paper. Because yeah, it, that's it's, interesting yeah. because most, uh, from my understanding, you make APOE in the liver, you make it in the astrocytes. But one of the important things is that it's it plays an important role in uh, bringing cholesterol, cholesterol from the yep, astrocytes yep, yep, to yep. the neurons, but also in repairing damage that's done. So you need to have neurite outgrowth to repair any sort of damage that's mm -hmm. done. Da damage with normal brain aging or traumatic brain injury, which is like damage in real time. Um, but I was under the impression that there's less, so APO, there's less uh, APOE expression in APOE4, and so that there ends up being a problem because the um, LDL receptor is very important for bringing the cholesterol to the neurons, to getting it there. And so, um, but, so, but so the so plasma, all, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, the and, plasma, and the other thing is, I think, the, and by the way, I could be wrong. I could, it's been nine months since yeah, I read yeah, this yeah. paper, so I could have it backwards. But I think the more important thing is, there's, I think there's two separate things going on, right? So the, the, the APOE4 gene also plays a role in, because my real interest clinically is, of course, lipidology. That's my mm -hmm. clinical obsession. Mm -hmm. And that's the place where I think we're becoming pretty clear now that the APOE4-4 or the 3-4 is not a death sentence in, in cardiac disease, especially the 4-4. The 4-4 was really viewed as, boy, you're guaranteed to have an MI before 60. And I think the evidence today suggests that once you normalize and correct for LDL particle number, or ApoB, yeah. it stops mattering. Yeah, those are definitely probably more important. Yeah, and, 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 and so, so, so with the... So, so 
Loosely speaking, this is an oversimplification, if you're a 3, 4, or a 4, 4, in theory, you should have a harder time clearing LDL particles from circulation. Right. And, and, but I think that that's not entirely the issue that you're alluding to, right? I think there's two issues you're talking about. Yeah, one, is that, one is the clearance issue, and then one is the cholesterol transport, the central part. Yes, there's. I mean, and there's also the the different the issues in yeah. the in the well the in the brain versus the liver. So I mean, we're talking about like the astrocytes are almost like little livers in a way, but not really. I mean, so there's like, you know, there's there's I think looking at the effects on the brain and looking at the effects on you know recycling LDL and all the yeah. other things going on in in the periphery are, are different. But by the way, I did just want to mention that between sixty five and eighty percent of all all cases of Alzheimer's disease, at least, you know. At least one four? At least one has a four. Between 65 and all, and 85, and 80 percent of all the Alzheimer's huh. cases. So. So the majority are three fours then? The majority of them have at least one allele. Yeah. Yeah. But fours. again, that's Having just based one on the allele. hazard ratio. We know that that's just a numbers game because 20, 20 to 25 percent of the population is three four. Right. So 25 to 20. Exactly. Yeah. So, but the, the, the point is, is but that the 3-3 three, three something... doesn't protect you from AD. No, it doesn't. So someone walking around with a 3-3 three, three shouldn't assume that, well, I'm never going to no, get AD. No, it does not protect you, but there is definitely something... Does the 2-2 two, two protect you? Two, two, the 2 does actually protect. Yeah, but yes. I'm curious. I, yes. I'm sure that some paper has the histogram of 2-2, two, 2-3. Two, two, it's three, it's three. protective. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, and so it's very Because in cardiac disease it does, and in cardiac disease the 2-4 is about the same as the 3-3. Three, three. The 2 and the 4 cancel. Wait, say it again? So the 2-4 is... The 2-4 is, is about the same as the 3-3. Three, three. Oh, good. In, again, just in hazard yeah, ratio. I found, I found out my mom was 2-4, and it was for the cardiac problem. I was kind of worried. Anyways, okay, that's very interesting. So we're totally going off on this uh, APOE tangent, but it's no something one, No that, one's even watching at this you know, point. You know, I'm very... <laughs> I'm very, I'm very interested in, uh, but there's a, there's a huge, huge component for lifestyle in uh, risk for Alzheimer's disease, particularly with having an APOE4 allele. And that's where I've become obsessed. You know, I see, you know, looking, I've been looking at mechanism, but also looking at, you know, the epi studies, looking at epidemiology, you see certain lifestyle factors, you know, for example, drinking, if you're drinking in your APOE4, because you're inducing damage that you can't repair as well, you're going to fare worse, you know. So anything that's going to damage your body worse, anything that's going to create inflammation, refined carbohydrate, eating a bunch of, you know, refined carbohydrates, a bunch of uh, sodas with, you know, added sugars, like all this stuff that's terrible for you, that's not, you know, whole food, food that's not something that's nutritious, um, that's going to cause inflammation. Inflammation, inflammatory molecules get across the blood-brain barrier, you know. So blah blah blah, all this damage can continue to occur. So. Obviously, diet, lifestyle play a very important role in your Alzheimer's risk. And I think that understanding the uh, biology of a what APOE4 is doing, because not only now there's you know research, a lot of it coming out of um, UCSF, Gladstone Institute, showing that in addition to a loss of function with APOE4 allele, uh, there's also a dominant negative effect. So apparently the APOE4 there's this two amino acid mm -hmm. you know, substitution. And structurally, if you look at the, the structure of the protein, um, it starts to get cleaved. And so it itself starts to accumulate these like aggregates that it then, you know, keep, you get more activated microglia and it keeps like spiraling out this whole inflammatory process in the brain. So there's also this dominant negative effect that's going on that's interesting. To, and, and you, you want to understand that as well. Um, but yes, um, Alzheimer's disease is one of the neurodegenerative diseases that are up in the top four or five, like you mentioned, causes Well, it's death. the top. It's the only neurodegenerative disease that's on the top 10 list of death. Top 10, yeah. Yep. So cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular is far and away number one. It's, one. Not, it's not even, I mean, cancer as in an aggregate is number two, but mm -hmm. as, as an oncologist, I sort of take an issue with that because cancer is a completely heterogeneous you know, genetic form of diseases. So, um, you know, to put this in perspective, right? So breast cancer, who's not afraid of breast cancer if you're a woman? Breast cancer accounts for 3% of deaths in women. I was shocked to learn wow. that, very low. I would have thought much, much higher. Now cancer in women, all cancers, 20, 21%. Mm -hmm. Cardiac disease, 22, 23%. So if you're a woman, if you ask anyone on the street, are you more afraid of heart disease or breast cancer, I think most women would understandably say breast cancer. 
and yet it dwarfs, it's dwarfed by yeah. cardiac disease by a factor of seven and a half to one. And, and we definitely know that diet and lifestyle play a major role in your you know, risk for cardiovascular disease. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no place where that's more obvious than actually in Alzheimer's disease um, for other reasons, which is- Oh, really? Alzheimer's? Yeah, I, I think so, More yeah. than, than cardiovascular? Well, I, 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 I mean, I say that just based on what I call the existence principle, right? So cardiac disease, I mean, I think that's entirely true. Um, I think cardiac disease is inevitable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and while we've had a deterioration in our lifestyle over the past 40 years, pretty precipitated and accelerated um, sort of move in the wrong direction on that, it's been largely offset by pretty amazing medical advances. So there's the three things that have, I think, allowed cardiac disease to remain in fact, it's actually come down. If you look at the death rate from cardiac disease, it's come down. So it's still the number one killer, but it's actually on a downward slope. Um, I mean, it's sort of plateauing. But when you look at what sort of the three biggest drivers are of cardiac disease, the first one is not disputed. It's smoking. So the, the, the data are really clear that the, if you could only make one behavioral change to reduce your risk of heart disease, it's don't smoke. Yeah. The next two are actually, because they are so cross-correlated, you can't actually distinguish which one's more important, are hypertension and elevated ApoB, or LDL particle number. Mm -hmm. um, and again, ApoB is the single best biomarker, or LDLP, to distinguish your risk of cardiac disease. It trumps LDL cholesterol, it trumps non-HDL cholesterol, it trumps triglycerides, HDL cholesterol. Those things don't hold a candle to LDL particle number ApoB. Well, think about it. Think about the advances we've made in the last 40 years on all of those, right? So smoking has gone from, you know, 45% of the population to 18% of the population. So we reduce smoking. In the U.S. In the U.S., that's right. Obviously, <laughs> we haven't done the same across the, uh, in the developing world. Um, think of the litany of drugs we have for controlling hypertension. And think about the litany of drugs we have to bring down ApoB. So despite enormous improvements in the three big picture drivers, it's still the number one killer. So it's got to be lifestyle driven, but we're blunting the effect of that. Whereas in Alzheimer's disease, we don't really have any pharmacotherapy plays. Like we're still arguing about what the, what the environmental trigger is. Mm -hmm. Is it all diet driven? Is it sleep driven? Is it stress driven? What's the combination of factors? Yeah. Is it a virus? Or is it prions? I mean, I've heard every argument right. under the sun, right? But here's what we do know. <laughs> we know that in the last 50 years, the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease has gone up about two and a half percent. Whereas the increase in our, long, per year, by the way, I'm sorry, per that's year, per okay. year. Um, whereas we know that our longevity has increased at about 0.6% per year over that same period of time. Now, over a 50 year period, a 2% spread per year of um, prevalence, actually, I, I think it might be incidence now that I think about it. I think it's incidence uh, and, and longevity suggests that Alzheimer's disease isn't just the natural response of getting old. Mm -hmm. There's something driving it. And even if you accept that part of that increase in incidence is a greater appreciation for the diagnosis, it's hard to argue that makes up the full 2% spread. Yeah. And so that's why I think that, that, to me that's the most convincing case for why there is something in our environment that's triggering Alzheimer's disease and it is not just the natural consequence of aging. Yeah. So what are your thoughts as to what are triggering Alzheimer's disease in terms of our... Environment. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's probably a combination of things, but mm -hmm. the yeah. most compelling evidence to me, and again, this is probably because I'm just a simpleton and I like to start with Occam's razor, is it's very hard to dispute the, uh, the, the, the high association between Alzheimer's disease and type 2 diabetes and hyperinsulinemia. And so... I'm in the camp of which some neurobiologists are, but not all. This is still far from being, you know, settled. Um, I, I sort of view Alzheimer's disease as brain diabetes. Mm -hmm. And I think of the APOE genotype as basically just a susceptibility. So I think anybody can get Alzheimer's disease with any genotype if there is enough insulin resistance, if there's basically enough difficulty in getting glucose through pyruvate dehydrogenase and into the Krebs cycle. So I think it's a neuronal energy problem more than, and I think all of the other things we see are results of that. But I think in terms of what the, um, what the driver is, I think it's a neuronal energy problem. And I think that's, I think all of the tau, plaque, the neuronal, the, uh, the, um, the synapse stuff, I think those are, th those are, those are byproducts. 
Um, and, and I think in animal models, there's some very convincing data that you can, you know, I mean, you've, you've seen this stuff, I'm sure, more than I have, right? Simultaneous insulin, you know, injection of glucose and insulin can transiently overcome deficit. Administration of exogenous BHB can overcome the deficit by bypassing and going straight through alpha hydroxybutyrate into the Krebs cycle. So where you can reverse the signs and symptoms. Now, um, I'm not particularly in this space, though I find it really interesting. Um, there's a guy by the name of... Um, Richard Isaacson. I don't know. Do you know Richard? He's a he's a neurologist at Cornell, and um, he has a practice that focuses on early cognitive decline um, that utilizes very low glycemic um, index diets uh, coupled with uh, MCT and stuff. So it's basically like inducing ketosis without a full on ketogenic diet, which obviously for many people is challenging. Yeah. Um, and he's seeing very promising results. And I think he's in. Uh, he's running a couple of clinical trials as well. And there's a whole sort of, I don't know what the word to describe it is, but like there's a whole network of people out there with, you know, all of their interesting data that are, because we don't have controls, we just don't know if this is like a performance bias we're seeing or if there's a, if there's a true impact. But, uh, but anyway, that, that's sort of my hypothesis, which is I don't actually know what's causing Alzheimer's disease. I don't know how to treat it. I don't know if it's treatable once it's in a late enough stage. Mm -hmm. But I firmly believe that if you can be as insulin sensitive as possible, for you as an individual, you reduce your risk. Now, that doesn't mean that the risk ever goes to zero for any of us, regardless of APOE genotype, but I know that if I have to choose between being very insulin sensitive and not so insulin sensitive, I'm gonna be better off in this camp. And I think that's frankly true for every disease state. Um, there are other things, there's subtle things going on, of course, IGF, of course, um, just to bring it back to where we were, um, IGF is really interesting because centrally and peripherally, you may actually want them to be in opposite directions. Right. Um, you probably know this, but Amgen had a drug uh, that was an IGF receptor antibody. It went into clinical trials, phase two trials, in pancreatic cancer, advanced pancreatic cancer, and it failed. Now, it failed despite reducing IGF levels at the receptor by 50%. You could argue that that failure implies that reducing IGF is irrelevant. Reducing IGF is irrelevant once the tumor burden is established. Reducing IGF to only 55% is irrelevant. You could argue 100 different things. But what's most interesting is that antibody does not cross the blood-brain barrier. And so today, there is, there is ongoing research, um, it's, it's all in animals at this point in time, that's looking at giving a diet that actually increases IGF but giving it in the presence of this IGF receptor antibody. The point being is can we raise IGF levels totally, primarily centrally, and then block the receptor peripherally? So we ward off cancer and diabetes, but we ward off dementia. Um, and actually there's even evidence, though I think this evidence isn't as strong, that elevated levels of central IGF also are protective against diabetes. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, but again, the problem is these are animal data, so you yeah. you got to sort of take everything with like a lot of yeah. Uh, so to just kind of bring it back to the uh, briefly back to the type you were talking about diabetes in the brain being Alzheimer's. Um, what's really interesting to me is the fact that neurons are actually mostly using lactate from astrocytes. Astrocytes are glyc glycolytic, so the astrocytes are supporting cells in your brain, which are using glucose, mostly or what using gluco glu glucose to generate lactate. Lactate then gets shuttled into neurons. Uh, and then the neurons, and the reason why neurons like that is because it's thermodynamically favorable, much like beta-hydroxybutyrate, which you right. mentioned, BHB, um, because it can shunt right into right, the TCA right. cycle in the mit mitochondria. By the way, how does the brain outcompete the liver for lactate? So, so like if you go out and if you if I made you go out there and do a bunch of burpees, right? Yeah. So um, you're um, the I'm blanking on the name of the transporter. Um, MCT. MCT one or two? Which one is the transporter out of the muscle? Oh, out of the I don't know okay, which so, one. So the, one but the majority of lactate is going to be generated in the muscle. So then that MCT is going to transport that out. Yes. And somehow remember, it's got to go through the portal system. Yes. It actually doesn't go through the portal. It passes through the, the, the cava, but it's still passing through the liver. How does the brain manage to get any out of without the liver taking it all into the Cori cycle? Which seems to me 
the preferential place to undergo gluconeogenesis? Yeah, so what's weird is that, um, I don't know the answer to your question. Um, I know that many tissues, and this has been shown through the work of um, George Brooks at UC Berkeley, who uh, actually pioneered the lactate shuttle hypothesis and the theory, um, but it's been shown that it's get, it gets taken up in, by the liver, um, it gets taken up by you know, the muscle, it gets taken up by the brain. In fact, yeah. Exercise itself um, has been shown to uh, preferentially cause the brain to tick up. Can we well, measure? You know, I don't know if you re read this literature, but there was a um, um, a lot of really interesting work um, back in the '60s done at Harvard with real fasting experiments. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, forty day fasts. So wow. You'd have inpatient subjects given nothing but water and minerals for forty yeah, days. Yeah. And it was done to basically demonstrate what the steady state fasting levels of glucose, insulin, BHB, and acetoacetate would be. And it's actually quite interesting, right? So you take a normal person, let's we take you, and let's say your insulin level is, you know, 10, your glucose level is 95, uh, your BHB level is unmeasurable because you're on a normal diet, and your acetoacetate level is unmeasurable. And then we just fast you. And it turns out that within about seven days, you'll be at a ketone level of five to seven millimolar. Glucose will be down to three to four millimolar, which is, call it 60 to 70 milligrams per deciliter. And you will stay at those levels in, you know, sort of for a very, you know, until at the end of the 40 days, they're still in those levels. So, stay the, same. so the glucose, you, so, so, so glucose never really goes away. What's changing is the consumption by the neuron, which goes from at the initial state being about 100% glucose. Of course, I don't think they were measuring lactate then, so we don't actually or were know. were they looking at neuron or just brain? Was it astrocytes or uh, They were probably just looking at brain, yeah. Okay. Um, but it would fall to maybe 40 or 50%, the, the rest of it being made up by the combination of the ketones. Yeah. And um, it's interesting that it never went to zero, right? So even to your last day of life, if you're being starved to death, you still have glucose in your blood. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of interesting that, like what percentage of overall brain metabolism do you think is driven by lactate? It must be very, very small and reserved for you know, a very, very specific subset of neurons or astrocytes or... Well, the astrocytes are using the glucose and they're generating the lactate. So the lactate oh, so doesn't have to get in. so we're not even seeing that. So that's, that's, that might be the issue. That. So that's probably why the liver yeah. doesn't matter because it's... Well, yeah, during exercise, I mean, but, but it has been shown that lactate will cross over the blood-brain barrier during exercise as well. But that is but why it doesn't But the dominant matter. source is... The astrocytes. Is... Yeah, the astrocytes are making it in the brain. And what's fascinating... So astrocytes don't have mitochondria. They do. So why they... do they make all the lactate? I think they make the lactate because the neurons, that's how the neurons are getting their energy. I think that's just the way <laughs> it works so out. So it's sort of a Warburg effect. The Warburg effect, of course, to me is interesting yes. because I don't buy the argument that the Warburg effect is due to my, uh, defective mitochondria. It's not. I, that, I, that was, Warburg showed that, I mean, he... No, there, original, are there are still a lot of people who think that it's a, it's a, that cancer affects the mitochondria and that's why the Warburg effect, but... I think it's just that the cancer cell is smart enough and it's optimizing for cellular building blocks. And it sounds like the astrocyte's doing the same thing. Okay. We have to for talk a different about this. reason. Yes, for a different but, reason. But it's but. really interesting. Okay, so we're totally just hopping around all these interesting topics. But, okay, to finish on the lactate thing, um, fascinating work. Traumatic brain injury, you know, also brain aging in real time. People with TBI are much more likely to get Alzheimer's, especially if they have ApoE4. Yep. You know, up, up to 10, 20 times, if they have, depending on how many alleles they have. But I used to do work with some professional athletes, and for guys in the NFL, if I saw yes. that they were ApoE3, 4, I, and again, this is completely bogus, but it's the best I think you can do. I would advise somebody who is an ApoE3, 4 entering the NFL that your number of concussions should be fewer than what is recommended. Yeah, I would, I would actually go as far to saying if you are ApoE3, 4, that head trauma in general is, is, is putting you at high risk. Yeah, for no, no, I, I completely agree. But of course, when you've got a guy who's about to make $20 million right, to right. go play football, it, and he's willing to like play until he gets six concussions, maybe you make it three. Yeah. Um, so back to the lactate thing. Very interesting. Yeah, so read up on this. Uh, you know, it, George Brooks, a friend of mine, he's working now with um, some other physicians at uh, UCLA looking at the effects of actually exogenous lactate 
on helping treat TBI because TBI. But why not just exogenous BHB? Or, yeah, or that, exactly. I mean, have you seen what Dom D'Agostino's done? I have, I've, I think I've read um, one of his studies on cancer. I think yeah, it was you, cancer. You should see Dom's work in TBI. But, so this, oh, in TBI, oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, That's how it, he got started. They're, they're the same. He's a neurobiologist. Oh, okay. The only reason he's in cancer now is because he saw, he, he started out working in neurobiology. Interesting. And, and using TBI models. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah but it, for, it's the for, same for, thing, lactate. Beta hydroxybutyrate, it doesn't matter. They're yeah, going they're, through the they're, they're completely overcoming. They're both. They're do, completely yeah, overcoming. They're both doing similar things. They're yeah. both thermodynamically favorable. They allow glucose sparing. They allow glucose th to then be, you know, used to make glutathione, which is important in the brain when you have damage. Um, but what's interesting is that TBI also disrupts astrocytes' ability to make lactate. And what I'm wondering when you but, were but talking about, but those two about, might just synergize. That that, that they may, might because because I also think I think the trauma. Causes an oxidative stress. So I think what's yes. happening is is pyruvate dehydrogenase is getting interrupted, and all of a sudden you are having a a a transient but violent interruption of energy to the brain. Yes. Um, and so from th this is obviously of high interest to the military because of blast injuries, and Dom would know this. So it's it's absolutely worth talking about this with him. I'm sure the DOD is all over this. I hope the DOD is all over this because the interesting question is: Do you have to have the BHB? or the lactate in your system at the time of injury to prevent it, or can administration be done immediately following the trauma? Or is there a kinetics? Is there a certain time? I think because of the fact that it allows glucose sparing, which if you have a trauma is, and this has been shown in animal models for TBI, that if you can prevent the, and this, but this was done by, um, putting glutathione uh, transcranially, which you, obviously is not going to happen. Yeah. But anyways, um, they could prevent like over 50% of the damage because they were able to sequester the reactive oxygen species mm. that start to damage, cause all the damage and the inflammatory pathways that start to get you know, out of control. So I think that if you allow that glucose to be used for the pentose phosphate pathway, within a certain time frame, I don't know what that time frame is, I think it was like, it was something within a couple of hours, hmm. then independent of the, you know, allowing your neurons to get, you know, this easier source of energy. If your neurons are using glucose because they need energy, yeah. but the glucose, that, you know, can't be used to repair the damage through the pentose phosphate pathway. I think that's one component of it in terms of the temporal yeah. effects, like how yeah. soon after the damage. Um, but anyways, all the, your, your Warburg thing, I have to just quickly tell you. So I also, I spent six years doing cancer metabolism at St. Jude uh, Children's Research Hospital. And I wanted nothing more than to believe that mitochondrial dysfunctional. Um, and that because was, of, yeah. yeah, because I, that would have made my whole thesis like so much easier. And I wouldn't have taken six years. Um, but I couldn't find that. I couldn't find that it's that. That, that cancer was causing mitochondria to be so dysfunctional that that's why they're glycolytic. Yeah, there's, a, there's an amazing paper that um, uh, Matthew Vander Heiden wrote yeah. in 2009 in Science with Lou Cantley and yes. Craig Thompson yes. on it that I was really, that was the, the time when I, that, that's when I sort of shifted my point of view on that. Yeah, well you mentioned that the, the cancer cells are using it for, I, I, I agree with you with the fact that, you know, cancer cells, um, the reason why they're glycolytic, I think, also is because it's quicker, and they don't really give a shit about, like... Well, they're optimizing for the building blocks to make more yes. cellular machinery. Right. Not, they're not, they're, they're basically saying, I'm, I'm willing to do an inefficient process of getting ATP yes. in exchange for something else. Yes. Um, but here's my other insight onto this, my other sort of theory. Um, by the way, I'm interested in how to exploit that. In other words, yeah. you don't have to know why that's happening to right. figure out how to exploit that. That's what that's what I'm interested. Well, in. here's what I think. Um, another reason why they've figured out not to use their mitochondria. I think the reason they figured that out, and this is why I also think why things like um, anything that'll activate pyruvate dehydrogenase or anything like beta hydroxybutyrate, anything that's going to force the mitochondria to work, right? So, like whatever it is, because you know, because the mitochondria are for the most part, not as active in right. the cancer cell. I think that anything that's going to force them to work, the reason why cancer cells don't want them to, to work is because cancer cells are primed to die. So this is the whole basis, most of the basis, behind how chemotherapeutic drugs work.
cancer cells are primed to die in the sense that our body has increased the amount of all these pro-death signals, pro-apoptotic proteins, to say, die, die, die. Cancer cells have increased all the anti-apoptotic proteins and right. signals, said, no, I'm not going to die yet. So they're like, balance is here. You know, they're primed to die. They're ready to die. All they need is a little push to the pro-death side, right? So if they have a chemo that's another activating more pro-death, it's enough to push them, the balance, into pro-death, right? Well... Mitochondria, when they're active, when you're highly metabolic, using your mitochondria, you're generating reactive oxygen species, species yeah. which are a pro-death signal. And I think that is one of the main reasons why giving DCA, activating the, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex can kill cancer cells. I think that's why uh, ketogenic diets, which are basically forcing the cell to use, you know, use oxidized fats, you know, which require mitochondria, I think that's also why they're you know very effective. Uh, so that's interesting. So you would think then that all things equal, a ketogenic diet would produce favorable cancer outcomes versus exogenous ketones. In other words, you could produce the same hormonal milieu with both, but in one of them, you don't have to undergo the machinery. So maybe, maybe. And the reason I, I say don't, maybe, and I, 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 yes. I find that interesting. I don't yeah. know the answer. The reason I say that is because um, cancer cells also want lipids, they like to build more cells and you need lipids to build yeah, cells. So that might offset. So I'm worried about that component of it. However, forcing if you think about it, normal cells aren't primed to die. So normal cells, anything that's activating your mitochondria in normal cells isn't going to kill them. And I think that's why it's a much better cancer therapeutic strategy than chemo because chemotherapeutic drugs also kill, kill normal cells, cells yeah. proliferating cells. You've got your hair, your skin, whatever is you know normal prol proliferating fast like a cancer cell. So I actually think that um, it's possible that whether that's, you know, fat oxidation through a, a more of a ketogenic diet, I think it's something that needs to be tested more. Like I said, I do have concerns just because you are giving, you know, a cancer cell uh, building blocks for more cells, which, of course, is, is always a concern. But I think that anything that is going to force the mitochondria to become active and generate that signaling you know, reactive oxygen species signaling to death, you know, to, to, to kill it is good. Um, it's also why taking dietary antioxidants, supplemental dietary antioxidants when you have cancer is very dangerous because you're blunting that whole signaling pathway, right? You're basically blunting all the reactive oxygen species that are usually signaling for your cells that are primed to die, for the cancer cells to die, and you're, not, you're sequestering it. Yeah. So it's like, you know, and that's been shown. But it's something that's inter interesting mm. to think about, um, and 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 I don't know. It's 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 a possibility. It hasn't been proven, but I think that it's uh, a, certainly an interesting hypothesis that should be looked at. And for all those people out there that are researching cancer and mitochondria, maybe we'll, they will. We'll, we'll be looking at it. Great, mm. great. All right. So I think um, we've talked about a lot of interesting things. And uh, you know, is there anything else you want to discuss or? Uh, talk about. I mean, I think we could talk about ISIS, but I feel like it takes us a little bit off course. So <laughs> probably. Not. Yeah, probably, probably.